So to round out our study of functions, equations, and graphs, we're going to be looking at two variable inequalities. Now with these two variable inequalities, there are a couple of concepts that we need to grab first. The first is the solution sets idea. When we work with solving equations or even graphing a linear function, we have a very specific set of solutions that will fit on that line. When we are dealing with inequalities in a two-dimensional plane, so we have our xy coordinates, our line is going to present itself somewhere on there. And then depending on the relationship between y and x, we're going to be looking at either everything below the line or everything above the line. So every, half of our field is going to be solution sets. Certain XY combinations will work, others will not. Now, what type of line are we going to have? When we graph inequalities of a single variable, we use either empty or filled in circles to indicate the whether or not we can be at our boundary point. If the circle is empty, this is for greater than or less than items. If it's filled in, it's greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. We have to have a similar concept when we are graphing two variable inequalities. For the greater than or less than items that do not have the equal option, we are going to use a dashed line. This indicates where the boundary exists at, but that we cannot actually use the items that are on that line. If it can be equal, we're going to use a solid line just as we've been graphing everything else. Excuse me, one moment. Little mistake there. Our, the last thing we need to look at is our test points. In order to confirm which side of the boundary line we need to graph on or shade in, we are going to pick a point on the graph and or on the grid and test it in our original inequality. Now, we can pick any point we want unless it's on the boundary line. Items that are on the boundary line will not tell us if we should shade above or below. They simply tell us where we're at. Also, the easier the point, the better. The point of choice for testing is the origin, 0, 0. It makes the computations a lot easier for comparisons. Beyond that, if 0, 0 is on our boundary line, either 0, 1 or 1, 0 become the next options. So let's start looking at graphing a couple of these. Let's graph y is less than 1 half x plus 4. Now this is going to graph out just like a standard equation. Our y-intercept is 4 and our slope is 1 half. That means from this point we rise 1 and move to the right 2 to get our next point of intersection. Now once we have these we have to determine what type of line to use. Since we have a less than symbol and it is not equal, we are going to use a dashed line to connect these points. And the last step for, gra step for graphing this is to use a test point. Since 0, 0 is not part of our boundary line, we're going to test it. So we're going to test 0, 0 by simply plugging in y is 0 and we want to know if that is less than 1 half of x being 0 plus 4. Well half of 0 is 0, 0 plus 4, 0 is less than 4, so our test point works out. Now what that means is that where our test point is located is in our solution set. So everything on that side of our boundary line is also included in our solution set. So that half of the graph will be shaded. Now if we picked a test point and it did not work, then what we're going to do is pick, uh, shade everything that's on the opposite side of our boundary line from there. Also a good rule of thumb, if you have a less than you're going to be below your boundary line. If you have a greater than for y, it's going to be above the boundary line. Now let's look at a different type of function. Let's look at an absolute value inequality. So here y is going to be greater than or equal to 2 times the absolute value of x minus 1 minus 3. 
So to do this, we're going to build a table of values. We have our x and y, and we're going to build around the concept of the vertex. What does it take to make inside that absolute value 0? And that is 1. And what happens when it is 0? y is 3. Then, our multiplier out front here, based on fact families or families of functions, our slope, our relative slope is 2. So that means we can go to 2 and 3, 0 and negative 1, and our slope is going to be 2. So from 3 we go 5 and 7. And remembering that absolute value equations are symmetric about the vertex, we're going to have 5 and 7 going the other direction as well. Now, plotting these points on our graph, we get those there. And then, what type of line are we going to be using? Since y can be greater than or equal to, we will connect these points with a solid line. Then, once we have that, our last step is to pick a test point. The test points I'm going to pick, again, is 0, 0, because it is not part of our boundary. So, I want to know, is 0 greater than or equal to 2 times the absolute value of 0 minus 1 minus 3? So I get 0 greater than or equal to 2 times the absolute value of negative 1 minus 3. That's 0 greater than or equal to the absolute value of negative 1 is 1, so we have 2 minus 3. Is 0 greater than or equal to negative 1? And the answer is, of course, no. So what that means is our test point is not part of our solution set. The test point, 0, 0, was below the absolute value v, so we're going to be shading everything above and inside. Now, this shaded region, including what does not show up on our given grid, is all part of the solution set. What is not, and, sorry, also included in that solution set is the line itself. On our first inequality, the line was not part of the solution set, only the items below it. So how is this going to play out when we start looking at a situation? So, you have a budget for buying music and movies on your digital device, your iPad, your tablet PC, your cell phone. A song is $1.50 and movies are $6 in SD. Uses less memory space that way. If you have a $34 budget for the month, what can you buy? Well, this type of equation, or this type of situation, is going to lend itself nicely to a standard form. If we have our x-axis represent the number of songs purchased, and our y-axis represent the number of movies, we're going to have $1.50 for each song and six dollars for each movie and we have to be less than or equal to our budget of thirty four dollars so that's how we can take the idea and translate it into a workable equation we obviously can't buy negative movies or negative songs now the content might be depressing or negative but we can't go negative on the actual items. So we're going to set up our axes so that all we're looking at is quadrant one. Now, how many movies can we buy? In order to graph this, the easiest way is to set up your simple table of values of x and y, if x is zero, and if y is zero. So if x was zero, we'd have six y's less than or equal to 34. We're going to solve this as if it were an equation and at y, sorry, is going to be 5 and 2 thirds. Now if x was 0, sorry, if y was 0, we have 1 and a half x is less than or equal to 34. And solving that, we get 22 and 2 thirds. So the maximum that we can buy is 22 and 2 thirds of a song, or five and two-thirds of a movie, but that what that means is that we're buying only one type of media or only the other. 
So let's go through and graph this and see where we end up in our grid system. We'll start by setting up our scale. And to accommodate all of our information, I did a split scale. On the x-axis, I counted by twos. On the y-axis, I counted by halves. So we're going to plot our two points of intersection, our y-intercept and x-intercept that we got from our calculations, as best we can. And then, as near as we can, we're going to connect these points. Now, what type of line should we connect with? Well, we can spend our actual budget of $34, so we're going to connect these with a solid line. And then we're going to shade. Now, looking at the context of this, this line represents the maximum amount of money that we can spend without going over our budget. So we're looking at everything, technically we're looking at everything below this line. But if you think about it, can you really buy half of a movie or a third of a song? And the answer is no. So what our answer space actually is, is all the actual points inside of here that sit as representing whole movies and whole songs. So we don't get the entire field. What we get is a series of discrete points that will tell us the exact items. So I put in some of them here. Remember that we're looking at a scale of two on our x-axis. So we could buy two songs and one movie as a small end or all the way up to 18 songs and zero movies or really 22 songs and zero movies. Anything, any of the whole points in here will act as an answer. So as you go through and graph and work with absolute value inequalities or two-dimensional inequalities, remember we're looking at a field of answers rather than just a specific set.